colleagues, fellow travelers. My name is Joshua Simmons, but sometimes I get some sign-ins or Simpson as well. And I am president of the Open Source Initiative. I go by Josh, my pronouns are he slash him, and I'm speaking to you today from Bucolic, Petaluma, California, land of the coast Miwok. I am so glad that you're here with me today. Today is, this, this is an interesting moment for open source and for OSI. It's no secret that open source has gone from fringe to mainstream. It's fanned the flames of open culture movements. It's empowered students, hobbyists, journalists, humanitarians, activists, and entrepreneurs, industrialists too. Today, open source is being tested, as it always has been, but on a grand scale. And while it continues to grow overall, it's losing hearts and minds. Questions dog us, setting aside run-of-the-mill fear, uncertainty, and doubt. People are raising legitimate questions. Are our projects sustainable? Are our communities safe and healthy? Are our maintainers being treated fairly? Is our work just? And can open source weather continued attempts at redefinition? These concerns are not new, but the scale they're playing out on is. An open source initiative, though it has sustained its core mission around licensing for 22 years, slogging through the legal janitorial work that makes open source adoption easy, OSI has not been a leading voice in these other conversations. Even on the topic of licensing, occasionally OSI has been found on its back foot. There is a lot going on. The title of this talk is an open source success at sea, which, though a bit melodramatic maybe, captures the mood of the moment. I'm going to try to cut through the miasma. We're going to talk through a few mental models, examine OSI's role, and explore one possible future. My goal here today is to ground us together in a shared narrative. Before I start, I want to tell you my own narrative. I want to share a little about myself so that you get where I'm coming from. I am a community organizer and a web developer by trade, which I've parlayed into working in open source strategy, first at O'Reilly Media, then at Google, now at Salesforce. I'm a dedicated advocate of open culture, inclusive community building, and ethical technology. <laughs> And I have a really bad habit of volunteering for things. My career kicked off as a freelance web developer in which I was selling Drupal and WordPress websites. I used and benefited from free and open source software. Gosh, it had to have been for about 18 years before I even realized that something special was happening. Like many, I took it for granted, both as a consumer and as a creator. But in 2013, when I first encountered the free software movement, when I discovered the philosophies behind open source, I was ecstatic. When I met the people and communities that made it all happen, I fell in love. Mostly, we, we have a little work to do. Because I've long had an intuitive love of the commons, a distaste for intellectual property systems twisted by special interests, and a natural tendency to get involved with communities, working and volunteering in FOSS, it's, it's at the intersection of so many things that I love. So in 2013, I dove in head first. And though I ran for the Drupal Association Board of Directors that year and was unsuccessful, I was broadly welcomed with open arms. Three years later, I'd make my first run for the Open Source Initiative Board of Directors, and I would go on to win. I've run for office twice more since then, and every time my platform is much the same. I run on a platform of expanding access and the open ethos, of diversity and inclusion, bringing new people into our communities, and mentoring the next generation of leaders. 
I run on a platform of putting OSI on stronger footing, making it a more bold and responsive organization today and tomorrow. And I lead with a steadfast commitment to embracing challenging conversations. Over the last four years, I've been OSI's chief financial officer, its vice president, and the chair of the staffing committee, endeavoring always to build bridges into software freedom, into corporate open source, and between cultural divides. Now, I have the great honor and privilege and responsibility of presiding over OSI as its president. Though after only seven years consciously in this field, sometimes it's a bit strange. I'm surrounded by people who have been here far longer than I have. And to be frank, it's a regular source of self-doubt. But I've learned to appreciate it for the asset that it is. Because that means that I come to the table with perspective, fresh perspective and humility. And that, that's been useful. Now that you know a little bit about where I'm coming from, I'd like to share with you some of the mental models that I use that I've cobbled together to make sense of the world. First, let's start with unpacking open source. There are many meanings of open source, and I view the most commonly understood meanings in layers. At the bottom, we have the foundation, open source, the open source definition itself a 10-point definition used to judge whether a license qualifies to be described as open source. Sometimes I think we maybe spend too much time thinking about licensing, but it is the cornerstone on which the entire facade of software, modern software development rests. Open source licensing enables all the other aspects of open source that we love. On top of the open source definition, we have open collaboration. Sure, the source code is openly licensed, but will you accept my pull request? Can I contribute new features? Or is this really just a vendor-driven project with an open source license? That's OK, but let's just be honest about these things. Lastly, atop open source licensing and open source collaboration, we have open governance. OK, so the source code is openly licensed. You'll even accept my pull requests. But can I influence the direction of the project? Are there safeguards against the project being relicensed without community consent? Together, these make up the core of what people understand as open source. There's also a broader spirit of open source, but that's more personal. And if you ask five people what the spirit of open source is, you will get six different answers. Speaking of asking five people and getting six different answers, while I won't attempt to define the spirit of open source, I do think it's useful to acknowledge some of the many, many narratives out there about open source. How you think about open source is no surprise uh, dependent on what your relationship to open source is. Among the narratives is a free software center narrative. Software freedom is a moral movement, and open source is about business. An author centered narrative. Maintainers are exploited and deserve more support, and maybe we should consider new licenses to make sure they get paid. A user centered narrative. Vanishingly few people have had the promise of user freedom realized for them. There are narratives that claim software freedom and open source are libertarian ideals that are unfit for the world we live in. And there are narratives that suggest that software freedom and open source can be viewed through more socialist and communitarian lenses. There are narratives from people out there doing the work to educate every last human being on this planet or coordinate crisis response or provide accessible self-service infrastructure for underserved people. Narratives that suggest, you know what? What we've got is working. 
And I haven't even gotten to the prevailing corporate open source narrative or how a small number of VCs want the marketing cachet of open source without the obligations or how activists are experimenting with injecting social causes into licenses. Suffice it to say, there are a lot of competing and complementary narratives about open source. And to be frank, there's a little merit to, to most of them, if not all. It's important to try and understand all these narratives because it helps us to make sense of the experiments we see in our ecosystem. Experiments in licensing, in collaboration, and in governance. This brings me to the last mental model that I would like to share with you. There are three primary motivators that drive people to experiment with licensing. And they are as old as licensing and open source itself. First, there's experimentation driven by changes in technology. For instance, we had the GPL, and then we had the advent of software as a service, which the GPL didn't quite cover. And so we got the AGPL, which closed the network loophole. We have the cryptographic autonomy license more, more recently, a license that was written with an eye on data ownership. There's experimentation driven by money. Of course there is. There's the shared source initiative, source available licenses, the business source license, things of that ilk. You know, we've seen this with Redis, with Century, with Mongo, you name it. And then we have experimentation driven by moral motivations. We have the JSON license, the vaccine license, the Hippocratic license. The JSON license was not the first moral or ethical license, so to speak, but it was one of the one of the most popular ones early on. The this software shall not be used for evil license. The vaccine life license, I think the names on the tin. The Hippocratic license is a license that is uh, injecting human rights obligations into the license. And look, I am glad people are experimenting. I'm sympathetic to experiments driven by a desire for justice. The evolution of licenses in the face of changing technology, that seems inevitable and necessary. And the experimentation in pursuit of greater profits is, well, it's understandable, if not terribly sympathetic or interesting. People see needs and they're trying to meet them. That's, that's great. And, but only to a point. Given my jobs, you're probably not surprised to learn that I'm wary of license proliferation. But we can have experimentation without risking that. Okay, I've told you about the moment we find ourselves in, about myself. I've shared with you three mental models that I use to understand the environment we find ourselves in. Now, let's talk about why we're here today. Why OSI is convening state of the source. Why OSI even exists in the first place. OSI's mission is to promote and protect open source. What might that mean? OSI is first and foremost a standards body for open source licensing. Derived from the Debian Free Software Guidelines, inspired by the Four Freedoms, maintaining the open source definition is the heart of this operation. And while the OSD is worthy of scrutiny, exploration, clarification, it has ingredients that were key to enabling the success of our spectacular comments, and it is OSI's job to mind them. While the open source definition is our North Star, the OSI approved license list is the offering that the world relies on OSI for. And then there's a license review process we administer. The process by which new licenses are vetted and added and, and considered for addition to the OSI approved license list, as well as the license discuss forum, which we use to clarify the application of the open source definition. As a standards body providing a standard, the open source definition, upon which countless people and organizations rely, there is one essential operation that animates 
all these key ingredients. Is that essential operation? Convening stakeholders. OSI is a vehicle of, by, and for the community. From day zero, it was about bringing people together with different ideas and motivations around a stable and shared understanding of open source, of a certain way of, to approach intellectual property that could change the world. There was never a day when everyone agreed about what open source meant in totality. But we've always been able to broadly agree on the open source definition. This bringing together of stakeholders, each with their own goals, in productive exploration of the applica and application of open source licensing. This is OSI's core duty. And it happens to be where we've fallen down most in recent years. More about that momentarily. With a sense of what OSI at its core does for the community, I'd like to take a brief detour through its past so that we can understand where we're going and we can be ready to talk about the future now this is a reductionist and inevitably incomplete view of osi's history <clears throat> but here we go founded in 1998 the organization was held together in its first decade through st strong board leadership in michael tiemann and De denise cooper deb bryant carl fogel and mike malinkovich and Simon Phipps helped OSI begin professionalizing by hiring general manager Patrick Masson and becoming more democratic with the introduction of a community elected board. Molly DeBlanc, Allison Randall, Stefano Zach Zakiroli, they fostered better ties with the free software community. Richard Fontana elevated legal discussions, taking OSI's licensing work from knowledgeable hackers to expert practitioners and defining a review process. The present board and staff are still busy at work, leaving legacies to be inherited and described by the next generation. Here's another way of looking at OSI's history. OSI as we know it did not exist until 2013. From, 20, from 1998 to 2013, it was volunteer driven and operated then it introduced board elections, took on its full, first full-time staff member in Patrick. From 2013 to 2020, under Patrick's stewardship, in concert with leaders like Allison Randall, Molly DeBlanc, and Simon Phipps, OSI remained volunteer-driven, but was operated, was staff-operated and with volunteer support. Over the last seven years, OSI has sustained its core mission, shaped policy around the globe, worked tirelessly to mitigate open washing, built an alliance of more than 125 organizations representing hundreds of thousands of people, provided a home for projects like Clearly Defined, and rolled out programs like Floss Desktops for Kids and the Open Source Technology Management courses with Brandeis University. OSI has been busy. We have seen incremental progress every year. OSI has expanded its programs and refined its operations. The trouble is our capabilities have not kept up with demand. Now it's the time for the next evolution of OSI. Two years ago, the organization recognized the need for the next transformation and began laying out a plan for staffing. In the intervening time, we have found ourselves shaving a lot of yaks to get to the overarching goal. We've also discovered that the path forward isn't just about hiring. It's about building a robust community engagement operation and refining our governance as well. That is what OSI has been focused on in 2020. We are preparing to evolve into an organization that is no longer driven by volunteers, nor so reliant on volunteer labor. We are preparing to hire an executive director who will be supervised by community representatives, that is to say, the board, and supported by a small but mighty staff. And we're building a community engagement engine right into the heart of it. Because 
like I said, OSI always was, always will be, of, by, and for the community. In 2021, you will see OSI hire not only an executive director, but a community manager and a communications manager. Because while this is the first state of the source, it can't be the last. For too long, OSI has relied on mailing lists and the casual privilege of knowing the right person to talk to. For too long, OSI has been reactive rather than proactive. The community needs a bolder and more responsive open source initiative. We want to advocate for the community, maintain a level playing field, ensure processes and levers of influence are documented, make every voice heard, and do so in a way that is both productive and doesn't systematically disadvantage underrepresented people. To do that, we're going to need staff capacity. Alongside staff, we're also making investments in a new code of conduct, better suited communications infrastructure, subtext, mailing lists are not the end all be all of communications, clearer governance, greater transparency, and a host of new advisory boards and working groups. All of these taken together represent what could be a radical transformation of OSI's role in the community, responsive to and consistent with, the with what the world has demanded of us. Yet, while it's a radical transformation in capability, there is nothing particularly radical about the process that OSI is going through. It's a natural evolution that all healthy nonprofits go through, albeit at varying speeds. <clears throat> this vision for OSI, a world in which the organization serves us all by being on the leading edge of open source issues, and providing a forum for us to navigate them. It's so within reach. But there's one key that I failed to mention so far, and that's you, you. Stakeholder this, constituent that, community engagement this, that, and the other. I am talking about you. An approach to intellectual property that was once seen as radical is now mainstream. In 2011, 13 years after open source was coined and the open source initiative was founded to promote and protect it, O'Reilly Media declared that open source had won. In 2016, Wired followed suit. Now, open source undergirds software development across a truly unfathomable range of applications and fans the flames of other open culture movements. It has inspired new ways of collaborating with each other, experiments in community governance, governance, and has been so successful that it is colloquially un understood to mean all of the above. This success brings challenges new and old on a massive scale. OSI has been given its mandate and we know how to make you proud. As we evolve, as we grow, we need your voice. We need your donations. We need your time. And together, we will make ours a more coherent, reliable, and representative movement. We will make ours a commons for posterity, one that lifts people up, and one that's built to last. Thank you. We do have some minutes for question and answer. I'm going to go ahead and allow everybody to open up their microphones and their webcams if they would like. Please be respectful and only have one person at a time. It doesn't look like we have any questions in the shared notes. So I'm gonna go ahead and unlock everybody. But again, please make sure that we um, be respectful of everybody. While uh, we have this dead air, I will both thank people for being here. 
Uh, I'm so glad that you're here, that we can have this conversation together. This whole event is, is such an important thing for, for OSI and for the community. Uh, I want to remind people that tomorrow we have a panel with, uh, with most, if not all, of the OSI leadership board and staff. Definitely recommend attending that. Josh, it looks like someone is typing a question into the into the shared notes there. Fantastic. Want to take a look at that? Oh, this is an excellent question. The question here is, what would the cost of this operation be? Moving forward, how would the financial situation be reflective of various stakeholders? Oh, I'm so glad someone's getting down to brass tacks here. Right now, OSI operates with a budget of about half a million dollars annually. Excuse me. The majority of that budget is, uh, is actually earmarked with a clearly defined member project. I think that's about half of our annual budget. So that means that OSI for its core operations and programs has about $250,000 a year. And that covers one full-time headcount, um, maybe half a dozen or to a dozen vendors, um, and then this, the, the services and infrastructure that help us keep the lights on. So that gives you a sense of what our budget looks like now. Our sense is that we're going to have to do a lot of fundraising in order to support this, the staff that we're talking about. For an executive director, we're definitely going to need to be able to offer more salary than we offer a general manager. For a communications manager and community manager, those might be able to start as part-time roles, but we, especially with an eye on the community manager role, it's going to be best if they're full-time roles. And so what we're looking at is probably uh, an increase in our annual budget from maybe 250000 a year for, for the core OSI things to maybe $600,000 a year. Yeah, that's more than a two-fold increase, um, but we've gotten a lot of support in the last year, just as much as people have been calling OSI in and saying, hey, why aren't you leading this conversation? Why aren't you in this space? Why are you behind on this? You know, just as people have been offering that that um, that that loving uh, criticism and, and very valid, people have also been stepping up to support us. And we have lots of offers of support. Should we put forward a plan that people can believe in? That's what this talk was about. That's what our session about is about tomorrow. And in the coming months, uh, especially as we get closer to hire, beginning the search to hire an executive director, we will be publishing more of our, our thinking and our planning so that you can have a sense of whether you believe we're on the right track. You can offer us feedback. We can course correct as needed. And you can decide if this is an investment worth making. And I hope it is because not only does OSI need it, it is really the only vehicle in the community that is in OSI's position as sort of this neutral party that can convene so many different types of stakeholders. So again, just in summary, uh, current annual budget is about half a million a year. Only about half of that, $250,000 a year, is actually on OSI expenses. The rest is for clearly defined. We're going to need to increase the core budget from about $250,000 a year to about $600,000 a year and able to do that. We expect that most of that will be done through corporate sponsorship and uh, one-off donations. Our individual members make up about $20,000 of, uh, of revenue a year. Suffice it to say, it would be a very, very long road if we tried to do that fundraising through individuals. Uh, we may also look at grants. Really, everything is on the table here. The next question I see here uh, from Jamie Clark. Uh, do, do I see OSI putting out some guides pathfinders into the question, I want to put some time into OSI goals. Where do I go? Where, as in go to this committee, this portal, the scope statement, et cetera? This is another really good question. And this is one of the things that has been really challenging for OSI. Though OSI has some official forums for people to communicate within, you know, I alluded to, to it in the talk, the OSI for a long time has relied on sort of the casual privilege of knowing the right person. Um, is anybody who has read the, the tyranny of structurelessness essay um, or is familiar with the challenges of undocumented governance and, and norms? That's a real problem and that disadvantages a lot of people. 
not only does it disadvantage a lot of people, it just frustrates a lot of people too. So this is where the community manager and communications manager are gonna be really important for us. We do intend to spin up uh, working groups and advisory boards and new communication mediums and different forums, probably not mailing lists. Um, that will be places that people can go to figure out how they can engage on a certain subject, whether they have time or treasure or just feedback, just feedback. We value all those things. There will be a clear way to support OSI in the coming months and in years. It's not that way right now, um, but that is really one of the core things we are looking to accomplish in the next six to nine months. So look for more on that front. Another question here uh, from Ruth Ikika. What are the plans of OSI to encourage more beginners starting in tech to contribute to open source? Because there is skepticism of not enough skill set, and some projects are not friendly to beginners in tech. I'm really glad you asked this question, Ruth, because that's near and dear to my heart. I spent three years of my life traveling the world promoting outreach programs, specifically Google Summer of Code, Google Code in, Outreachy, Rails Girl, Summer of Code, and the like. It's so important to me that we bring new people into our projects, into our communities, for a lot of reasons. First, because our communities are not representative of the world around us. And unless our community demographics represent or are representative of the world around us, we will inevitably build software that does not serve the globe, that does not serve everybody. Whether that's because our software doesn't, uh, wasn't designed with people with last mile connectivity in mind, accessibility features, you know, whatever the case may be, if we don't have those people in our community, our software often lacks the features and uh, for uh, accommodations that they need in order to use the software. So first of all, we need our communities to be more representative. Second of all, we need these other skill sets. One of my great complaints about open source is that we put code on a pedestal. So much of the time it's about show me the code or show me nothing. And this is a problem because I think we all know that great software is more than just code. It's the user interface, it's the user experience, it's the marketing, it's the design. There's so much quality software. And if we don't have those skill sets in our communities, well, again, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna let, it's gonna be wanting. So what is the plan to bring new people into the world? Yes, I've, I've just spent a little time just defining why we should and, and the, some of the dimensions of that that are really important to me. But how are we going to do that? Well, for me, it's about promoting uh, outreach programs as much as possible, mentorship programs, uh, making sure that uh, collectively as a community, we are putting money on the line for people who can learn. For instance, I'm a strong believer that relying on free time and volunteerism filters out a lot of very qualified people that we desperately need in our communities. And so I wanna make sure that there are paid internships available to work in open source, more of them at least. It's also important to me that we provide, create more documentation and entry points to, to our communities. Of course, codes of conduct, building a culture of mentorship, being a welcoming community. These are all issues that will help us recruit more people. And then lastly, we really need to think about how we can recruit those people with different skill sets, the people that we're not reaching. You know, for instance, in the design community, having come out as a freelance web developer, uh, come up as a web developer, I have a strong sense of just how sensitive designers are about spec work, aka work for free. Asking people to work for free is different in different contexts. And labor should always be compensated, but it's definitely free labor is more sensitive in some areas than others. And so we need to find ways to meet designers where they're at. We need to find ways to meet technical writers with where they're at. There's no one answer, but these are things that we must solve and we must invest in together as a community, but then also OSI. And I think you're gonna see OSI create a range of documentation and, uh, and, and put together jumping off points that can help be a, can help light the way for people who are new to open source and who happen to stumble on opensource.org. I think we've got time for one more question here. Um, 
we've got a question here from, from Justin Flory. What do you see as immediate milestones for increasing and improving organizational collaboration with OSI beyond fiscal sponsorship? This is another excellent question. There are a few ways to engage with OSI right now in an organizational capacity. There is, uh, there is of course, a financial sponsorship. There's, of course, you know, which we get from our corporate donors. Then there are our affiliates. And our affiliate members are communities, schools, clubs, uh, other open source projects and foundations that share, share our values. That is where we get the bulk of our representation by proxy through our affiliate members, which have far larger communities than OSI does itself directly. So organizations can become an affiliate member. If they do, they are able to vote in our elections, able to put people up for election uh, and participate in our quarterly calls, as well as the affiliate uh, forum that we have yet to spin up, uh, but plan to along with the other forums that I mentioned. So there's corporate sponsorship, there's affiliate membership. Um, another way to engage with us in an organizational capacity is to fire up a working group. So OSI has a, a fiscal sponsorship program where we host member projects like Clearly Defined, Floss Desktops for Kids, and, the, uh, and programs like that. You can spin up an incubator project. You can spin up a member project with OSI as a host. You can spin up a working group with OSI as a host to focus on an issue that is near and dear to you that you would like to convene people to discuss and explore with OSI's sort of official blessing. Now that's about the limit of what we have in terms of formal organizational engagements at this point, but this is exactly what we're looking to improve. Working groups we plan to spin up uh, in a number of subject matter areas like standards, for instance. Working groups are a way that we can bring volunteers together, uh, people to work through specific issues and come up with um, you know, some sort of deliverable. Working groups are a vehicle for getting something done. And then there are advisory boards that we plan to spin up also in a range of subject matter areas. And that is really just to provide a sounding board for OSI to provide intelligence to the community to make sure that we're on top of the issues that you're noticing that maybe we haven't yet. So in summary, organizational ways to engage with OSI. Yes, of course, there's financial sponsorship. We appreciate that. We need that. But then there's the affiliate membership. And I would encourage you, whether you run an informal user group or, or an open source project or something more formal like a, a club at a university, become an affiliate member so that you officially have a seat at the table and you're the first to learn when changes are coming down at OSI. Can spin or spin, spinning up a working group if there's an issue that's near and dear to your heart? We can explore that together. Or consider asking us to spin up an advisory board or ask what advisory boards we have that you can participate in uh, that you can help us, that you can use to make sure that we're on top of the issues that matter to you. All of these are opportunities. Some of them are less well-developed than others. But again, these are, this is an area where I expect you'll see a lot of change in the next six to nine months.